If you're a fan of the Battletech video games, or are looking to try a more tactically challenging and affordable game than Warhammer 40,000, you may be wondering, how good is the Battletech Introductory A Game of Armored Combat starter box? To answer that question today, we're taking a deep dive into the box's contents, comparing the cost of the Battletech hobby to its top competitor, Warhammer 40,000, and then inspecting the quality of the miniatures. If you watch the end, you'll have some key tips on how to get the very most out of the starter box. Let's start with one of the most important factors to a lot of folks, the cost. The A Game of Armored Combat box is priced at $60 US and is intended as an introductory product to new players who want to try tabletop. On recording near Black Friday, it looks like Amazon's dropped their price, and don't expect it, but my box also came with a $20 voucher for anything on the publisher's online store. So what do you get for the price? Well, quite a bit. The box includes a universe primer, a short story to introduce the setting, two colored maps, a punch board for proxy mechs and additional terrain, a quick reference sheet, two six-sided dice, a rule book, record sheets to track the status of the mechs, pilot cards for the Alpha Strike version of the game, and eight miniatures. And I know what you plastic hoarding wargamers are thinking. Well, how many miniatures do I get? Catalyst Games was extremely generous here by providing 9,000 battle value worth of models in the starter box. Battle value is the system that Battletech uses to balance the power levels of its units. 9,000 battle value is equivalent to about 3,000 points in Warhammer 40k. Normal games can start at about 5,000 battle value aside. That means right out of the gate, you'll have more than enough for yourself and can even play a smaller game with a friend. Compare this to a $90 to $150 box of Warhammer Start Collecting, which only have about 400 to 700 points, and it makes it pretty clear which game is more affordable. 400 to 700 points isn't actually enough to play a proper game. Larger narrative campaigns of Battletech, like the ones we're recording soon for this channel, can be done if both players have about 15,000 to 20,000 battle value aside. This is achievable by purchasing just one or two additional lance boxes. Okay, so we've established that the starter box and Battletech as a whole is much more affordable than competitor games like Warhammer. But does the content of the starter box give a player a good start into the hobby? Let's go over how to get the most out of the smaller items in the box before taking a look at the quality of the miniatures. First up, the Universe Primer. It's a short magazine that introduces the major factions and eras the player can play in. It does a pretty good job of defining the grittier man versus man struggle of the setting compared to the high fantasy man versus alien or superhuman versus alien setting of Warhammer 40,000. The novella is a short 15 to 20 minute read that demonstrates what the setting is like. If you like Warhammer 40k novels, you'll probably enjoy the short story. These two items are made a bit more cheaply than the others, but this is excusable, as I don't feel that there's something to be held onto. Next up are the two full-colored maps. They're made of a nice quality paper and are double-sided, with a grasslands terrain on the front and a desert theme on the back. The first map is dense, with hills and forests, which favors much more mobile mechs, while the second is designed to be more open. This is really good, because it lets a player discover how terrain will affect their mech's performance. The map colors also do a reasonable job at matching the Clan Invasion expansion set. This was a really good design choice because it means as a player's collection expands, all their maps can be used together. The additional punch-out sheet was a really nice add-in. The terrain gives even more variety to experimenting and changing up the map. My only wish was that there was more of it. The punch-out battle maps also seem well made. My friend and I are spoiled Warhammer players, so we prefer the actual plastic miniatures, but I can see players using them as is, or putting a post-it note on them to proxy a mech they want to try before buying. No box sets are perfect though, and there were two items that were a bit of a miss for me. The first is the reference sheet. It's black and white, which made it hard for me to read. As first-time players, we never use them, since we were flipping through the rulebook anyway and as players who ended up liking the game, we were able to find better colored ones on the internet. The second bigger issue was the dice. There aren't enough of them to play the game right out of the box. The game even says it's highly recommended to use white, black, and red dice to mark how mechs move, but the set only gives two. You'll want three per mech that you're using. So in a standard four on four game, you'll need 12 if you're just playing for yourself or double that if you're playing with a friend. An easy fix if you don't want to buy additional dice is to make little chits out of cardboard. You'll need one for walk, run, jump, stationary, and modifiers 0 through 4. Okay, we're gonna hit the miniatures in less than 2 minutes, I promise. But when you have some time, there are a few things you'll want to do to preserve some of the most important parts of the box set. The first is protecting the rulebook. The design is quite durable. My original copy lasted me quite a while and a number of drink spills. But your best choice would be buying a 3-ring binder and plastic sheet protectors to make the rulebook last. Just to undo the back staples, cut along the crease, and slide them in. The second are the mech record sheets. Shame treatment. Undo the staples, cut them, and get them into the protectors. This method not only lets you store easily, but also lets you endlessly reuse the sheets if you have a dry erase pen. 
Feel free to mark up the paper sheets if you want as well. You can download a PDF copy of all the record sheets from the Battletech website. I'll provide the link in the description down below. Lastly is to sleeve the pilot cards. These are used in the faster Alpha Strike version of the game. I'd recommend you protect them with card sleeves and then put them away into protective three ring sheets so everything is stored neatly into a single Battletech binder. For maximum protection, double sleeve with the Japanese brand KMC Perfect Fit for the inner layer and the KMC Super Series for the outer layer. A word of warning, while this product is rated very well by trading card game enthusiasts, I personally haven't tried them out yet. By the way, Commander, if this video has been helpful to you, I'd invite you to subscribe. And if you want to go deeper into any of the lore of the mechs we cover and how to pilot them to their maximum potential, I've made an in-depth video on each of them on this channel. Now let's take a look at what you're probably most curious about, the mechs. First up, the Locust. As you can see on the picture to the right, he's a huge upgrade from the previous model. The new figure has a nice dynamic pose. I really like the detailing of the circular hip joint on this guy. The flashing, or lines created by the molds during manufacture, doesn't look too bad. Nothing that can't be taken off with a hobby knife. But it looks like the left arm was glued a bit lower than the right, and the nose gun is a little bent on the model I received. Not to worry though, the arm is able to rotate, so we can just pull it back up with a bit of a twist, and by warming up a bowl of water and holding him down for just a few seconds, we can make the plastic nice and soft and pull the nose back into position. The Locust is one of the most iconic battle mechs from the Battletech franchise, and lore-wise, it's one of the most common throughout the setting. Its popularity means it'll fit into any faction you decide to collect and in any time period. The variant in the box is the standard 1V. I rated a C+, for performance on the tabletop. You can use this guy as is, but if you're looking for a bit more anti-mech punch, try out the 1E variant, popular in the Capellan Confederation. Next up, the Commando, the other light class mech in the box. Again, big upgrade from the old model's balloon head and chicken legs look. The new one has nice chunky legs that give him some weight. Nice shooting pose on this guy. The mold lines on him aren't too bad, but a bit challenging on the top of the head. For that, I'd recommend you scrape it off gently with the back of a hobby knife, as so not to nick the top. The feet make it a little difficult to know the facing of the mech when playing, so I definitely recommend making one hex side a different color. Lore-wise, this mech is mostly available in the Lyran Commonwealth and not much else. Its limited availability makes it the weakest mech in the box in my opinion. I would have liked to see something with universal availability like the Javelin. Performance-wise, the original 2D is a bit of a glass cannon with high offense but low defense. I rated it a C+. The best variant in my opinion, if you don't want to run the original, is the 1B. Moving on to the medium class of mechs here with the Wolverine. The new model is an upgrade from the original sculpt. I really like the design on the back of the mech and the clean look of the SRM6 on the new figure. Decent pose, the mold lines are placed well and really minimal, but a bit of a quality issue on the left shoulder for my figure. Some kind of giant whirl. Now, this does look terrible on this close-up, high-def camera shot, but when I looked at it with my naked eye, it's actually barely visible and would likely not show up when you painted it. But still, it's a little bit weird. The Wolverine is available to all factions in all time periods, and has the command mech quirk, which means it can lead your lances into battle. Performance-wise, I suggest you skip the original variant and go straight for the Free Worlds League 6M. We rated it as an A-tier mech for an initial grade, but will very likely end up being an S-tier mech in the final analysis. The other medium class mech is the Shadowhawk. The new pose is much better than the just standing there pose of the old figure. It's an iconic mech with its shoulder cannon and has some nice medium sized panels that should be fun to paint up. The model looks relatively easy to repose with its joints. Here's an example of an artist who rotated the arms in one of the legs of the new sculpt to make it look like it was charging into battle. Availability wise, the Shadowhawk is available to all factions in all time periods. It's one of the most commonly available media mechs in the setting. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite perform on classic tabletop because of its inefficient weapons loadout. We rate it as a C tier mech. Flawed, but it's still usable. Making do with mechs that were designed poorly because of politics and corruption is opposite from Warhammer 40k's constant power creep, and it's something that I found very interesting to explore in the Battletech setting. Not to worry though, in later eras, the Shadowhawk does get better. If you're playing during the clan invasion during the Battle of Tukayid, take a look at the Clan Buster 2HT variant. Moving on to the heavy mechs with the Catapult. This sculpt is much better than the older ones that all look a bit awkwardly proportioned to me. I like this guy's little rabbit ears, and the detail on the back of the LRM15 boxes should be fun to paint. Quality wise, I feel the front four medium lasers are a bit lacking. I would have liked them more defined. Now, this didn't happen on my new box, 
but the first box I purchased, the ears were pushed too far together. To fix that, you would do the same warm water method that we did with the Locust. Just dip them in and bend them back into position. Lore-wise, this mech is a rare gem in the setting, with no factories producing the model until the Draconis Combine restarts production in 3033. The Catapult will perform in nearly any mission you want to take it on, and it's an interesting multi-role missile boat skirmisher. We rated an 8-tier mech as an initial grade. For variants, the most interesting one would be the Cretan K2. Next up, the Thunderbolt. Like the Catapult before it, the Thunderbolt is a big upgrade from the older sculpt. They definitely improved the proportions on this one. Really well-defined 3 medium lasers and SRM-2 launcher on the chest, with an iconic canister-style LRM-15. This guy makes asymmetry look good. The left arm has a really cool slab of armor as the shoulder guard, but I think the two machine guns on the arm could have been done a bit better. Biggest problem is the mold line that runs along the legs and into the detailing of the knees. Yikes. That one's going to be a problem to take out without losing any detail. The design is found in all factions and is a solid frontline battle mech. The Tarn Concordant uses it extensively. You'll be happy to have one on your side. The Thunderbolt is a B-tier mech that gets a bit more tricky to pilot because of its weapons management. So see our pilot guide if you're having problems. If you're looking for more flexibility, you can check out the Mercenary 5SE variant that mounts jump jets. On to the big boys, the assault mechs, starting off with the awesome. The new sculpt definitely has a nicer chunk to it compared to the sloped shoulder pads of the old figure. I quite like the circular plate on the shoulders that lets you put on the crest of your unit. I see no real issues with the sculpt other than some basic cleanup with mold lines. It's a simple, tough to beat tank of a mech that perfectly encapsulates the technological regression of the setting. Three particle projector cannons with a small laser, a mace-like battle fist for backup, behind an incredible amount of armor. The Awesome had widespread distribution during the Star League era and is available to all factions. It's particularly popular in the Free Worlds League. It may not make it to the Swimsuit Edition of Mechs Illustrated, but this mech shows up and performs. We rated an A-tier mech as an initial grade. It will be a strong contender for the S-tier. I recommend you take it as is. No variants needed. It's that good. Last but not least, the Battlemaster. The new sculpt overall is heavy duty and industrial compared to the 60s spaceman style of the older model. Nice crisp detailing on the shoulder mounted SRM-6 and four chest mounted medium lasers. If I had to be picky, I think better detailing could have been done on the left arm machine guns and two rear facing medium lasers. The pistol PPC is good and the large jelly bean shaped cockpit gives the opportunity to painters to really show off. Lore wise, it used to be a double seater for a commander and a pilot. The Battlemaster has decent availability to all factions and in all eras. On tabletop, its reliance on close range makes it a bit risky to use. The initial grade marks it as a B-tier mech. If you wanted to try something more balanced range-wise for your commander, you could give the 1S variant a try. If you found this video valuable, please subscribe. And if you do decide to make a purchase, please consider using the Amazon affiliate link down below. I'll be using the money to create better videos for you. Thank you.